Laura, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to be invited to participate with such a uh, distinguished group of speakers over these uh, several days. Uh, it's been a, an education for me. I mean, as you might expect, I'm going to talk about the role of culture in uh, the urban environment in the cities of the future. Um, I'm going to try to set this argument up by um, <laughs> establishing um, a few points um, early on. Um, first of all, I believe that culture is vital to our society, that it's biological, that it's embedded in the human DNA. I think it's a social necessity. I also think it's an essential physical, social, educational element of the urban environment. At the beginning of the 21st century, culture, contemporary culture, by definition and by necessity, must be both local and global at the same time. And I think it's also important to note that sophisticated contemporary culture is a function of continuous innovation and evolution. Sophisticated contemporary culture is demanded by a highly competitive global society that values high practitioners and excellence. The quality of intellectual capital and achievement in the visual arts, for example, are not simply subjective any more than literature or music develops without recognized standards for excellence. Excellence in the world cultural stage is achieved through these things, the development of new ideas, diligent and obsessive refinement, by harnessing technology and devising new applications, by bending them to the artist, in this case it's interchangeable with the visionaries, imagination, and also as a function of that artist, his or her ability to mobilize resources and to market their product. Now what I mean by that is uh, think of uh, the iPad. I mean, we've talked a lot about it. I note that not only have a number of speakers referred to the iPad, but we're all carrying one uh, thanks to our hosts. But think of the iPad and then think of a sculpture by Anish Kapoor. The sculpture in Chicago. The technological achievement of realizing an object on this scale requires the same type of thinking, application, understanding of technology, mobilizing resources, developing a product, and selling it to a wider audience. My point here is that Culture is not only an individual exercise, but it is something that speaks to society. Do I aim this at something? Yeah, it's okay. Now, that's going to lead to a discussion of buildings. The experience, or in fact the consumption of culture for both visual and performing arts, requires platforms. Cultural platforms add to the quality, variety, excitement, stimulation, vitality, and opportunity in the built urban environment. And cultural platforms foster innovation and competition. My organization is the antithesis of, uh, uh, of Gensler. Uh, we don't have 2,000 employees, we have 12. But our collective experience over the last two decades, most of mine at the Guggenheim Foundation, is that we've been responsible for the planning and development of 28 museum projects around the world. I'm going to show you six, because I think these six illustrate some of the points of the diversity and the vitality of culture in an urban environment. In Bilbao, Spain, in Abu Dhabi, in Beijing, in Baku, in Vilnius, in Istanbul. The project that we've been involved with that probably has attracted the most attention has been the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this was a joint venture between the Guggenheim Foundation and the Basque government. Uh, it began in early 1991. The museum opened for the first time in 1997. I think what's important, it's probably the greatest success, certainly, has attracted the most attention. 
of any of the projects that we worked on. And I want to make this point, is that culture in an urban environment often has extraordinary economic benefits. The Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, if you calculate its construction cost, its uh, operating endowment, and the amount of money that was put aside for acquisitions, cost in the early 1990s about $375 million. What it's produced in the 11 years since the museum opened is a total attendance of about almost 13 million visitors. And this is a city that has a population of 600,000 people. Uh, the direct expenditures induced by this visit visitation were close to $3 million. The tax revenues to the Basque government during this period of time uh, were over $400 million. And the museum itself not only inspired uh, and was the center point of a whole urban regeneration in the center of Bilbao, but it created almost 4,500 4, permanent jobs. And the art that we purchased uh, for the museum over a 10-year period, we spent $10, $10 million a year for 10 years, $100 million. Uh, because it was public money and marked to market every year, uh, was valued in 2009 uh, almost at $400 million. So culture, in many ways, was a very important um, investment. The largest project, of course, by far, is the Guggenheim Museum in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this project started in 2005. Uh, and in fact, when we got involved um, with the first uh, master plan was developed by Gensler Associates. And that plan has largely remained intact, the division of the island into a series of districts. But I'm showing you here a satellite photograph from 2009 when I first set foot on Sadiat Island in uh, 2005, the population uh, was exactly zero. Uh, and they are planning a city of close to 200,000 people. Um, the mass of that triangular island is about 28 square kilometers. And the green circle is where the Guggenheim Museum is going to be located. And the red circle is where uh, the Louvre is going to be located. Uh, the Guggenheim produced the master plan for the cultural district, which was one of the six districts called out in the, uh, the Gensler plan. And you can see in this model of the master plan, which we presented for the first time in January of uh, 2007, that's the Guggenheim Museum on the top, uh, the Louvre, then uh, Zaha Hadid's Performing Arts Center, uh, a uh, maritime museum, and then if you follow the, the man-made canal uh, where you see a cluster of orange buildings, those have been replaced now by the new National Museum designed by Norman Foster uh, with the Sheikh, the Sheikh Syed Museum, uh, which will be the first museum to open. But that plan was produced in 2007. Um, what that barren island in 2005 will look like uh, in another 10 years is captured in this rendering. You can see the Guggenheim Museum in the foreground, uh, the Louvre in the background, new bridge that connects the island to uh, downtown uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and most of the buildings, mixed-use buildings that are in the cultural district. So this use of culture to inspire large-scale urban development is virtually unprecedented at this scale. Uh, as a detail, this is the, uh, the, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel. And you can see both in the Frank Gehry design for the Guggenheim, where he has these tremendous cones, which were inspired by wind towers in Arabic architecture, uh, this dome that covers the, essentially the gallery buildings of the uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, is particularly inspired by local culture. This project was presented for the first time uh, in uh, at the end of January in 2007 uh, in Abu Dhabi in an exhibition that filled about uh, 1,000 square uh, meters. It was anticipated to be up three months. Uh, that was, um, I guess, now almost six years ago. Uh, the exhibition is still on view. Um, at the time, 
Uh, it was met with uh, great international attention uh, and I think has put Abu Dhabi in the forefront of uh, urban planning and using culture as a tool for urban planning. A third project that I want to talk about which is completely different is one that we're working on now in Beijing. Um, some of you who have traveled to Beijing probably recognize the Forbidden City, which is inside the moat here. And inside that blue line uh, is the Imperial Ancestral Shrine, which in the 1950s was put under the control of the Beijing Workers' Labor Union to use as a cultural palace. Uh, last spring, the Beijing Workers' Labor Union hired us to develop a plan for them to convert this into a major museum in part because 11 million people a year visit the Forbidden City. Uh, and this is probably in China maybe even a kind of ground zero for cultural activity. Uh, the three main buildings of the ancestral shrine, you see the first uh, temple building here is 33 meters high, so that's the equivalent of a 10-story building. Uh, and right now, most of these traditional buildings, there are 11 of them, 11 of them are in a state of, of more or less maintained decrepitude. Um, what we have ultimately proposed is that three new temporary buildings, uh, they're technically temporary in the sense they'll be like the pavilions at the Shanghai uh, Expo, uh, will complement the 11 existing buildings and together form a cultural complex that will produce a series of world-class exhibitions. About 50% of those will be devoted to Chinese subject matter, both contemporary and traditional, uh, as well as using the traditional buildings for uh, commissioning large-scale contemporary art. Uh, this project is planned to uh, open, if all goes well, in about two years. And of course, using the courtyards for a sculpture like the uh, Anish Kapoor uh, would be something that we could also do. A fourth project, very quickly, Baku in Azerbaijan. Uh, this is designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel, completely different character. It plays on the, uh, the uh, importance of the oil industry uh, in Azerbaijan. It has a kind of rough industrial feel to it. Um, the project also provoked a rethinking of its location on the waterfront in the port area. And part of our design was to come up with a concept by which uh, a natural marsh, in effect, uh, this, uh, uh, you see circling this part of the harbor, operating as a lung. We, we commissioned a uh, landscape architect, Edaw, to design uh, a filter system a natural filter system, which in effect would clean the waters of the Caspian Sea, which is one of the polluted, uh, the most polluted bodies of water, and would allow that waterfront to become part of the urban fabric of the city. So this is another example of where culture can inspire a, a new dimension in urban development and city planning. Um, a fifth project, quickly, in Vilnius, in Lithuania. This is designed by Zaha Hadid. Um, the new building uh, would occupy a, a park halfway between the old city, the 18th, 19th century city, uh, and the communist buildings of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, a fifth project, a sixth project actually, in Istanbul, um, quite small, um, is the Demsa collection. It's a private client uh, who has a collection of 2,000 works mainly Turkish 18th and 19th and early 20th century works as well as Islamic manuscripts. The architect is Zaha Hadid. Uh, it's inspired by Islamic design and architectural motifs. Uh, the museum sits on the Golden Horn and it is part of a major redevelopment of the former industrial area of the Golden Horn. Uh, these are examples of the existing Demsa collection. But some interesting things happened in the planning of this museum. Uh, one, we noticed that uh, the, um, still having trouble making this move, <laughs> but there we go. Uh, we noticed in planning the museum, which you see in black, uh, that also part of the negotiation with the government was to protect a, uh, a, a, a late 19th, 19th century hammam that had fallen into disrepair. And while we were looking at that, uh, the, uh, uh, the client, 
uh, decided to buy the land on the block immediately behind the museum and then wanted to go ahead with plans to develop a contemporary component to complement the existing collection. Uh, so we began to, we, we created the notion of building a box in effect uh, that would be behind the traditional museum. Uh, this complex of the renovated hammam, uh, the, the museum for the existing Demsa collection, and the big box of about another 7,000 square meters for contemporary art uh, would make a vital new cultural center for, uh, for Istanbul. Um, that cultural center will uh, uh, be able to show works of, uh, of enormous scale from contemporary artists all over the world. Um, so what are the conclusions of this? The cities of the future will become multicultural melting pots with huge similarities and huge differences that are a function of different histories and different geographies. They will be driven by new technologies and new systems to dramatically improve efficiencies and save time and energy, and we've seen that in the, the prior presentations. But it's also important to note that these new uh, cultural institutions will continuously speak with existing cultural institutions. And it's in that dynamic, that juxtaposition of the old and the new, that I believe that the vitality and the future of our urban environments will reside. From a cultural perspective, I believe that the world is on the threshold of becoming what Michio Kaku yesterday called a type one planetary civilization. The collective cultural mind, that's the, the mind, the cultural mind of the planet, is simultaneously moving toward a greater diversity and a greater commonality, both at the same time. A global syntax and language for culture will coexist be, be, uh, next to traditional norms. There will be a global language for art. It is already happening, and it will shape the future, nature, and identities of our city, cities more than technology alone. And I'll close with this final, uh, this final proof. I mean, this was a, a photograph that we took in Abu Dhabi in 2009 when we invited four established art artists, a German artist, Anselm Kiefer, an American, Jeff Koons, a Lebanese, Mona Hatoum, and an Indian artist, Anish Kapoor, uh, to come to Abu Dhabi to look at the plans for the new museum and to meet with local Emirati artists. And it's this juxtaposition of putting together putting together local artists and cultural traditions with global artists who are operating on a scale. I believe that this kind of synergy will invigorate our cities in the future uh, and offer a new prosperity uh, in the exchange of ideas. Thank you very much.